Good evening everyone and welcome to the council meeting. I'd like to declare the meeting open at six minutes past six. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge that tonight we meet on the lands of the Wadjuk people of the Noongar Nation and on behalf of the City of Vincent we pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging. In terms of apologies, CEO, I've just had notification from Councillor Dan Loden and Councillor Rosalind Harley that they're both running a few minutes late but they will be joining us shortly. Um, public question time. Welcome members of the public gallery. This is your opportunity to speak on an item before Council this evening. We do ask that you come to the microphone and state your name, your address and the item to which you are speaking and we do ask that you do speak for no more than three minutes. So there is no order, it's just a matter of whoever wishes to come forward first. So please go ahead, thank you. Application for leave of absence from Councillor Jonathan Hallett, seeking leave of absence from the 25th to the 28th of July 2018, inclusive for personal reasons, and from 22nd to the 25th of August 2018, inclusive for work commitments. Councillors, can I please have a mover and seconder? Moved Councillor Harley, seconded Councillor Loden. All those in favour? I declare it carried. Thank you. Um, I don't believe that we have any petitions, deputations or presentations, so we'll move to confirmation of minutes and they are for the ordinary meeting of the 26th of June 2018. Can I please have a mover and seconder to adopt the minutes? Move Councillor Hallett, seconded Councillor Murphy. All those in favour? I declare the minutes carried takes me to announcements by the presiding member and um, I just have two quick things to talk about this evening um, and the first that I will mention that has just been raised in the public gallery is our strategic community plan. Um, I for one am very excited to see it on the agenda um, and it was um, the result of, of three months of very deep diving into community engagement with our community um, and we do believe that this was the, the widest and broadest and deepest community engagement that the City of Vincent has undertaken. And, um, what we believe that we have arrived at is a, a document that we can say we believe has been created by our community and the objective tonight is to release that for community consultation to test, to test that and to see whether that rings true for the community members who participated through our community engagement. I think that um, one of the things that we did do quite differently this time was to engage a completely randomly selected and independent community um, panel and one of, I think, our favourite things in the community strategic plan is the vision that they came up with, um, arrived at independently, completely independently from council. Um, by taking the feedback received from the community, they came up with the statement that in 2028, the city of Vincent is a leafy and vibrant 24-hour city which is synonymous with quality design and sustainability. Its diverse population is supported in their innovative endeavours by a council that says yes. So we are prepared to embrace that and um, rise to the challenge and while there'll be further debate on the SCP later in the meeting, um, I think that we can say that the language, the content and the intent of that SCP, um, we have tried to be incredibly true to what was presented to us by our community members. Also just to briefly mention that on Sunday we're celebrating National Tree Day. We'd like to invite all community members to join us at Les Lilliman Reserve where we aim to plant around 8,000 native tube stock species and uh, transform an unused area of that reserve. So please join us on Sunday from 8am at um, Les Lilliman Reserve. Um, we'll have a sausage sizzle and we do encourage you to bring a trowel. So please do come along. Um, we'll now move to declarations of interest. Thank you, CEO. Thank you, Mayor Cole. I've only received one so disclosure of impartiality interest from Councillor Joanne Fatakis in relation to item 9.8, the Harwood Place West Perth item. Uh, Councillor Fatakis has disclosed the extent of her, her impartiality interest is that she was employed by a real estate firm owned by the owner of the property between 1997 and 2003 and as a consequence there may be a perception that her impartiality on the matter could be affected. Councillor Fatakis has declared that she will consider the matter on its merits and vote accordingly. And I've not received any other disclosures. 
Thank you, CEO. I'll now go around the table and see whether there are any items that council members wish to bring forward other than those that have already been raised by uh, members of the public this evening. Um, so far, those are 9.1, 9.8 and 13.1. Councillor Gondoshevsky, do you have any further items to raise? 9.3, 9.4, 10.5 and 12.1, please. Can you just repeat those? That was pretty quick fire there. 9.3. 9.4, 10.5 and 12.1. Thank you. Councillor Toppelberg. Nothing further. Councillor Fatakis. Councillor Loden. 9.6 and 10.3, please. 10.3, sorry, is that what you said? Yep, okay. Councillor Murphy. Nothing further. Councillor Nothing Harley. There. Councillor Castle. Councillor Hallett. Um, I'm, I'm going to request 9.11 be brought forward. And also 14.1. Through you, Mayor Cole, council members, members of the gallery and uh, others streaming into the meeting, I'll just read through now the list of agenda items which Council will adopt the recommendations of on block as printed in the agenda. And they are items 9 9.2, 9.5, 9.7, 9.10, 10.1, 10.2, 10.4, 11.1, 11.2, 11.3, 11.4 and 13.2. All of the remaining items will be discussed and debated by council members independently. Thank you, CEO. Can I please have a mover and seconder to move these items on block? Move Councillor Harley, seconded Councillor Loden. All those in favour? I declare the on block items carried. So that, um, just to explain to members of the public gallery and to anyone who's streaming from home, the way that we do approach the council agenda is to go to those items that were first raised by members of the public gallery. So the first item that was raised this evening was item 9.1, which is number two of 18 Robinson Avenue, Perth, proposed change of use from residential to unlisted use, short-term dwelling. Can I please have a mover and seconder for this item? Standoff. Thank you, Councillor Toppelberg. A seconder, Councillor Fatakis. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I don't support the officer recommendation. For me, it's quite simple. Uh, when we looked at uh, short-term accommodation, one of the things that we considered uh, of particular importance was uh, the need for there to be strata approval uh, in, um, for properties uh, of this nature. Um, some of the issues that have gone on. Uh, uh, that have uh, been explained that have gone on with the, with the unauthorised operation uh, uh, don't necessarily directly relate to the application before us, but for me it's quite simple. The way that, that the policy is worded uh, was for the Council to provide protection to, uh, to, strata, to strata owners or to a Council of Owners or a body corporate to be able to uh, have control over what happens within... Uh, and that is quite a difficult process is my understanding uh, from a legal standpoint and uh, if we've taken a view and made that view public that as a council that we wouldn't support it uh, in the instance where proposed operators can't get the support of their council of owners, uh, I don't think we should be throwing a red herring in there and providing uh, approval for the use and then letting them fight it out elsewhere and legally. Um, I do respect the fact that the applicant did initially have uh, the support of the council of owners. Uh, and they uh, did do the right thing and seek their, um, and seek their consent before they um, went down this path, but uh, clearly that's been withdrawn and I think that there's, uh, uh, for me, there's a clear uh, onus upon us to um, stick with uh, that element of the policy and to um, support the Council of Owners uh, uh, should, that, should that change in the future. I see no reason why. Um, so I know that there is an alternative before us that uh, has two reasons for refusal, one relating to uh, the appropriateness of the use in the setting. I, I, um, 
don't necessarily support that reason. I think that uh, Robinson Avenue, Perth, in, in general, is something that can accommodate uh, this type of uh, this type of use. But uh, on the basis of the particular application that we have, uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm happy to stand by the policy and to support the Council of Owners, uh, and won't be supporting the officer recommendation. Councillor Fatakis. Um, look, for those very same reasons, um, it's uh, unusual to get a mover and a seconder that both aren't going to support the, um, the motion, no. Um, but I certainly won't be approving that, and um, I echo um, Councillor um, Toppelberg's uh, sentiments with regards to the difficulty of managing um, these types of accommodations within strata. Um, developments I feel for the Council of Owners, um, but in this instance I will not be supporting um, uh, the, mo uh, the um, motion to actually uh, accept that. I won't be supporting the officer's recommendations. Councillors, Councillor Harley. Through you, Mayor, just before I make my comments, can I ask a procedural question about um, whether for this one we need to move an alternative motion which refuses the application and outlines the reasons? Um, we will do. If this is voted down, I will put the officer recommendation and it depends on if it's voted down by council and then there is an alternative that has been requested by Councillor Gondoshevsky, which council may wish to consider. Um, thank you. I just I want to put my comments on the record as well and this is not... Um, we have had a few requests over the years um, involving um, involving applicants who are part of a strata and I think it's really important to understand about who the actual owners of these properties are that are making the applications. They are um, strata complexes and I live in one. Uh, they're never simple things to deal with. Um, I think this maybe raises some issues for us, not just in regards to applications such as this for residential, but possibly um, may raise some issues that we need to consider as a council about where we're getting other applications um, within strata complexes of either residential slash commercial or um, wholly commercial for a range of uses. So for me it raises not just an issue about this particular application but um, about whether due diligence um, or who needs to do the due diligence rather than it be our responsibility for a range of applications and that also includes where Alfresco is being proposed in um, residential commercial mix. So um, for, there's a range of reasons why I won't be supporting but primarily because I'd like to see Council of Owners um, approval um, embedded. Thank you. Councillors, any further comments in relation to the officer recommendation? Okay, I'll put it all in favour of the officer recommendation to approve the short term accommodation. All those against? Thank you. Um, I believe that we have uh, a alternate motion. Do I have a mover for that? Councillor Gondoshevsky, seconded Councillor Fatakis. Thank you, Mayor. Um, look, I just echo the comments of the um, other councillors here. I think that in these circumstances um, and in line with the city's policy that council of owners um, support for these sorts of applications is critical. Um, and so. The alternate motion uh, is, um, refuses the application on the basis that the uh, short-term dwelling does not comply with the temporary accommodation policy as the consent of the Council of Owners has not been given. And it also um, considers the local setting in relation to the impacts on um, amenity and compatibility um, on the basis of noise parking and traffic associated with the proposal. Um, I think, uh, you know, um, it's a question of how um, niche we want to get down to in terms of local setting. I note in this instance that um, the um, dwellings all do face onto or you know have um, a communal central area, and so there may be more interface between short-term uh, accommodation clients and existing long-term residents that may exacerbate any impacts of amenity in this particular location. Councillor Fatakis, do you wish to speak? Councillor Toppelberg. Uh, thank you. Um, I'll speak first. And so, just I just want to reiterate. So, the wording that's in the policy, because it's not re referred to in the report, so I do want to read it again. The wording in our, um, our temporary accommodation policy talks about strata. It's clause 2.1.2. It doesn't say strata title or a council of owners slash strata company approval should be sought in the first instance. It actually states. Temporary accommodation will not be supported in strata title situations except where the consent of the strata 
company slash council of owners has been given in accordance, etc. And I think that for me that it hinges upon it, that that is actually written very much in the negative and it's not something that it's not historical like some of our uh, policies are. This is something that was well considered by council in recent times and was an effort to try and provide that protection and also put the incumbents back upon the applicant to be able to get the approval of the Council of Owners before seeking the broad community um, that is represented by council. So for that reason, uh, I will be supporting the alternative, but I will seek to uh, delete uh, reason two. Um, I don't know that I'll get a seconder if I don't speak to it first, so I'll... I'll well, you I'll, can't I'll, speak I'll, to it until you have right. a seconder. We'll see how we Herein go. lies the quandary. Yep. <laughs> um, would anyone wish to second that amendment, oh. Councillor Murphy? Thank you, Councillor Murphy. So uh, I think that we have a policy that clearly sets out a management plan and otherwise, and I think that the applicant has reasonably addressed some of those issues in relation to noise, parking, traffic impacts in terms of their, uh, the proposed management plan. The adherence to it is something separate, but I think that we, we do have a policy framework that provides for those things to be managed. And I personally have a difficult time saying that something in the 6000 postcode uh, that is street frontage with its parking right uh, at the front of it uh, that addresses the street whilst this particular property is within a strata complex and made my, issue, my concerns clear about that. I, th I think that broadly, I think I, I have a hard time saying that, uh, that broadly within this location, um, uh, where are we, that it's uh, not considered compatible with the setting on the basis, and as Councillor Gontoshevsky said, that's open to interpretation what the setting means, whether it's this particular dwelling, its access to common property or otherwise, but I, uh, I, I personally would be more comfortable uh, with the principle of the, the policy not supporting temporary accommodation where the strata, uh, strata company hasn't provided consent in, in the first instance. Councillor Murphy, do you wish to speak to the amendment? I'm happy to support uh, Councillor Toppelberg. Councillors, we're on the amendment, which is uh, moving the deletion of Clause 2. Are there any further comments? Um, I'll speak against the amendment. I do think that in this circumstance it is important to consider um, the uh, the compatibility. I think that the fact that we have seen um, impacts on amenity by the operation while it was um, seeking retro retrospective approval is important. I, I do acknowledge in the report that it talks about that we uh, as a council should consider the development approval before us, application rather, and not the activity alleged to be currently occurring. And I do um, I do note that whenever we consider development applications, we're often talking about number of complaints received and what sort of impact the use has on the amenity. And I think here we have a proven situation where um, the residents have been able to show that there have been significant impacts on the amenity through noise, through um, not following management plans, through uh, numbers not sticking to what um, was approved initially by the Council of Owners. So um, in that regard, I do believe that Clause 2 is relevant and I do support keeping that clause. Any further comments in relation to the amendment? I'll put it. All those in favour of the amendment? All those against? I declare the amendment uh, lost. We're back to the substantive. Are there any further comments in relation to the substantive motion? I'll put it. All those in favour? Declare it carried unanimously. The next item that we will be dealing with this evening is item 9.8, number 1216 of 17 Harwood Place, West Perth. This is a section 31 reconsideration of conditions which has been to mediation at the State Administrative Tribunal in relation to a change of use from multiple dwellings to service departments. Can I have a mover and seconder for this item, please? Moved Councillor Murphy, seconded Councillor Gondoshevsky. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, before I make a comment, I did just have a question um, through the chair. I wanted to know what the previous grounds for approval of a three-night minimum stay when last this um, when last this came to council were. Previous grounds for approval when last we, we came to council when we approved a three-night minimum stay. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, as part of the 2016 
application. Uh, the applicant voluntarily proposed a minimum three night stay uh, as part of their management plan. Um, that request, or well, that sorry, that uh, that requirement was carried through to Council's 14th of November 2017 approval, largely on the basis that it was thought that such a condition would deter people from staying at the service apartments to host parties and gatherings. Uh, looking through the, the previous minutes, it didn't add a, a great deal more than that, that broad explanation that it was about uh, parties, gatherings and antisocial behaviour. Thank you. So the proponent um, put in their own management plan that they wanted to have a three night minimum stay to prevent having parties uh, at the premises. Do you know why they might have um, changed their point of view? Through you, Mayor Cole, the, the voluntary offering of the three night minimum stay was part of the 2016 application, which I believe was a different applicant. Okay, great, thanks. Um, look, I um, appreciate the city uh, working with the current applicant to improve um, the management plan. Um, clearly there's issues on Harwood Place um, with this development over a long period of time. Um, I support uh, having security patrols every two hours, Friday, Saturday nights. Um, I think the management plan, uh, you know, is good. In, in, it uh, reflects the community's concerns and it seems to um, be a good uh, deterrent if there are problems in the street due to parties. However, I do uh, strongly feel that a minimum two night stay uh, is needed um, to uh, pre well, as a as a potential to prevent a problem that shouldn't exist in the first place, um, I don't believe that the uh, short-term uh, accommodation uh, zoning uh, allows for 24-hour party function centre. Um, I don't believe short-term accommodation even allows for. Um, uh, one night stay. I do want to um, mention as an objective in our own policy um, short term accommodation objective number th uh, two which states to ensure a high standard of amenity for long term residents and the occupants of short term accommodation through requiring the provision of a business management plan and car parking management plan which is good. Um, uh, number four, ensure properties for short-term accommodation purposes do not have an undue impact on the residential amenity of the area. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, this is uh, in breach. Um, we have uh, grounds to, um, to uh, enforce a minimum two night stay and I would like to um, foreshadow that I will be putting up a, uh, an amendment. Um, the yes. seconder has just indicated that she's happy to move your amendment if you wish to go straight to it. Okay, great. I'll uh, like to put up my amendment 9.8, uh, which states the accommodation duration is limited to a minimum stay of two nights for all guests of the service apartments, 2.1.5. Do you wish to speak further to it, Councillor Murphy? No, I think I've done enough, thank you. Councillor Gondoszewski, do you wish to speak to the amendment? I'm just going to say two brief things. Um, I think firstly, um, I note the um, response in, in, uh, in relation to, um, from administration in relation to the proposed amendment around minimum might stay and, and indeed some of the commentary um, from Ms Morich in the gallery that um, a minimum night stay um, has not um, that they're calling into question the nexus between a minimum night stay being imposed and um, uh, potential for parties to be hosted and, and sort of um, putting forward um, an individual case where a booking of a multiple over multiple nights had a party on the first night and I just from my perspective that um, 
that reasoning doesn't necessarily stack up. I think that it fails to consider the preventative effect of the minimum night stay. Um, I mean, uh, I mean, it's a bit like saying if you're in a car accident and you're wearing a seatbelt and you get injured that essentially, you know, seatbelts are rubbish and let's chuck them because they haven't prevented the injury. It doesn't actually consider that perhaps we would have been seeing far more complaints and issues than we had have done. Um, so I am supportive for that reason. Um, and whilst I note that um, the city doesn't necessarily impose a minimum night condition as part of our temporary accommodation policy, I think that um, our uh, council's decision making and um, has been clear on this over a number of years, um, furnished as I was by a five year review of our previous decisions on short term accommodation and service departments um, late last night. Um, so I, I did note um, that in all bar one case of short-term dwellings and service departments that a, um, either the management plan, approved management plan, or the condition specifically referenced a minimum night stay. And in the one case it was because that the, um, well, my assumption is because the owner or operator resided in an ancillary dwelling on the same site. So I think there is certainly some evidence that, um, that has been um, utilised by council, um, not just um, through the um, that not certainly not just as part of a commercial um, arrangement um, on the part of the applicant. So very happy to support this amendment. Councillor Toppelberg, can I just ask a question through you to the acting director? And I apologise if you don't have the information because I'm not sure that you've been you were at the city at, at the time. But just my understanding is, broadly speaking, that the changes that have occurred since the last application, uh, which was my understanding that's been the enforcement of the two night minimum, that the residents have responded to say that there's been a, a noted reduction in uh, uh, in the level of antisocial behaviour or issues that they had with the premises. Am I correct that prior to that, even though the condition applied, that there was no minimum night uh, being enforced and so that the enforcement has only been uh, happening for roughly uh, eight months, I think it is, thereabouts? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, um, I don't have the complete corporate history of it, but um, the previous approval um, granted by Council on uh, 3rd of May 2016 and as amended on the 14th of November 2017 did actually refer to a minimum of three nights stay. Uh, in terms of the compliance regime around policing that, I am not sure at this stage. And just. A question. I, I note the officer's comment. I note that it's not placed within the actual amendment itself, but the officer's comment talks and obviously it has issues if this, uh, well, it's been made clear that the condition would be contested. But in terms of the questioning whether there's a nexus between the minimum night stay and the potential for parties, does it need to? Uh, uh, my understanding is that the principle of the amendment is not necessarily between parties and the minimum night stay, but more so that since there has a minim been a minimum night stay been imposed, the nexus between, broadly speaking, antisocial behaviour and issues at uh, the property have noticeably lessened, and that's something that's been uh, evidenced, or it's evidenced by the level of complaint and, understand and feedback from the community. I know there's been some conjecture about it, but I, I guess I have concern about whether we are specifically, given the nature of the comment, is it necessary? Is it necessary to identify what the planning nexus is of, or the planning reason is for the amendment being proposed and what it's actually intending to achieve? Because I'm not so sure that it specifically relates to parties, and my concern is that if it's approved and that, with that comment that's in there, that it will then be contested on the basis that it's been placed purely to prevent parties. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, the imposition of a condition of development approval needs to satisfy certain criteria to be valid, and it basically needs to serve a proper planning purpose, and there needs to be a, a nexus between the condition that's imposed and the planning outcome that's to be pursued. Uh, in this case, administration of the view that, uh, subject to an appropriate management regime, uh, the core issue seemingly being the potential for antisocial behaviour can be appropriately managed. Uh, and at this stage, staff have not seen any information or not privy to any information that would suggest there is a 
demonstrable link between a minimum night stay and a an actual reduction in antisocial behaviour. Uh, and for that reason, staff are of the view that an appropriately worded and implemented management plan is the more appropriate path. Councillors, through you, Ma'am. Thank you. Um, to the Director, I just want to go back to an answer that was provided, I believe, to Councillor Murphy in regards to what's changed from the time the management plan was put into place for where the um, applicants were volu voluntarily asking for a three-night minimum to now, and you said that it was a change of owner. Are you able to confirm that? Who was the owner then and who is the owner now? The applicant, I beg your pardon? I'm not sure of the exact word that you used, Director, whether it was applicant or owners, but it, it seemed to be relevant. That's why I'm wanting to double check. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, I'm not able to confirm the, the owners or the applicants for the previous application at this stage. Sorry, through you, Chair. I just want to clarify because one of the reasons the Director gave for the change in the previous request to Council was that they were different applicants. So that's why I'm asking for clarification. It seemed to be important that that was the change between then and now. Councillor Murphy asked what the difference was. Um, through you, Mayor Cole, um, without, well, all, firstly I'd say that all of that information would be contained in the previous public council reports on this item because we always include applicant and owner details. My understanding is that the ownership of the property has not changed. However, um, the director in the context of that statement referenced a change to the applicant. Um, whether we refer that to the applicant as to who has applied for this application in this instance or the applicant's represent or the, the proponent's representative, which might be a different term to use, um, the proponent has different representation now to what they have previously had. And that much we know for a fact. So Ms Morich is representing the proponent in this instance in relation to this SAT matter. Previously, the proponent, uh, as I recall, was represented by urbanista planning consultants. And um, whether or not they have an ongoing relationship with the proponent for the sake of this application, I'm not sure. But the fact is that Ms Morich is representing the applicant in terms of the matter that's currently before Council, not Urbanista, as was previously the case. Thank you for that clarification, CEO. I asked the questions for clarification because I actually don't believe it makes any difference who was the owner, who was the applicant, who represented who. Um, I, I asked the question because it was the principle around why that came before Council and then how we as a Council factored that into our decision making. And the minimum three night stay was seen as a real deterrent to antisocial behaviour. Um, so I guess I've got a question back to the administration because I think it's important when making statements that we, we understand that the decisions that we're making, this is a very tiny street, very tiny street, the impact on this street of antisocial behaviour is far greater in my personal opinion than it would be if this, if this was on Newcastle Street for, for, as an example. So. Um, I guess, does this administration have any evidence that a, a one-night stay doesn't lead to antisocial behaviour? Because one of, the, one of the comments that was made is that the administration doesn't have any evidence that the three-night stay reduces antisocial behaviour. I would argue that I don't want to make, have that experiment happen on Harvard Street. Um, I believe that this street, it is tiny. This is a very large development, albeit it was all done through the, you know, th uh, through council, it was all approved. This is a tiny street. Um, and um, the impact on this street, in my view, is magnified than what it would be on a larger street with different parking issues, etc. Noise, I believe, would be. Um, um, I don't mean amplified in natural decibel, I mean the impact um, on the amenity of that street and the residents, I believe, um, would be far greater. And I believe that the three-night stay should stay in place. I don't support the, any downgrading um, of the minimum stay. In fact, I believe from, and we may have to go back, we didn't have um, cameras recording our every word back then, but some of the discussion was around two night stays being often a Friday and a Saturday night, and Friday and Saturday night being football was used as one of the examples, and when people come in for concerts in the city, whereas a three night stay means people are 
First of all, if there's antisocial behaviour on the first night, you've got some remedy um, on the second and third nights where you can go to the owner or the manager and where the people in that room um, can actually be dealt with um, in, in whatever way. The same would apply um, for a second night, reducing it um, down from what it currently is after such a short period of time and after what we think may be new policing um, of that three nights day, I think is a real backward move and um, I'm not prepared to make a decision that could um, um, increase the impact um, to the residents on that street and have them face a loss of amenity. So I don't support the amendments and as a result um, I won't be supporting um, the officer's recommendation and I guess on that basis um, and I apologise, I didn't do it in advance, but I will foreshadow an alternative recommendation, which is um, a refusal of this item. Um, Councillor Harley, it still, still remains open to you once this amendment is dealt with to move an amendment to um, have a three-night minimum. What is currently before Council is an amendment for a two-night minimum with an officer recommendation that makes um, no minimum recommendation. So, Councillors, um, we are looking at a two-night minimum at the moment. It wouldn't be necessary for you to move an alternate, but you are, um, you know, you may wish to move a, a further amendment. So, councillors, in relation to the two-night minimum, is there further comment? I'll put it. All those in favour of a two-night minimum? All those against? I declare it carried. We're back to the substantive. We now have a two-night minimum. Um, and we're back to the substantive to discuss any other issues relevant to this application. Councillor Gonshevsky. Um, may I just raise the, um, the issue that um, uh, Ms Morich raised in the gallery in relation to condition 2.1.2 that um, currently requires the CCTV footage of the service departments to be monitored at all times by the manager staff of the service department, Sister Hotel, Attica Hotel. Um, and then for it to be available for immediate review 24-7. Um, um, just a question through you to the Acting Director of Development Services. Um, I just don't have it to hand in relation to um, the current staffing arrangement at Attica Hotel. I think Ms Morris uh, foreshadowed that that is not staffed 24-7 or at all times um, and how uh, this condition is proposed to work in practice in, in relation to that. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, staff don't have a preconceived notion of how exactly it would be implemented. Obviously, if it was uh, imposed by council, it would be incumbent upon the, the operator to ensure it is complied with. Um, how they do that specifically, uh, staff have had no previous discussions with the applicant on that matter. So, Director, just to follow up on Councillor Gonshevsky's question, the hours um, that the CCTV would be proposed to be monitored by the applicant, um, I believe there is a, is there a, um, the, the hours of reception being attended? Could you just highlight those hours? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, the Attica Hotel reception hours uh from 7am to 9pm, Monday to Friday, and from 9am to 5pm on weekends and public holidays. Thank you, Councillor Gonshevsky. Um, look, I, I, um, I actually accept the argument that the 24-7 um, monitoring of the CCTV footage is uh, probably a uh, an, an unreasonable expectation. I think that um, I think it is important that it is available for immediate review. I think that it is important that we have a clear management plan and servicing strategy and a code of conduct is um, to be uh, made available. You know, to be communicated to guests. Um, but on the basis of the um, CCTV covering only common areas, um, I. I think that it is probably too great an imposition um, and I think that um, I do have some concerns about um, the um, current recommendation um, but I, I don't feel that it is appropriate to swing too far in the other direction and, um, and so with that in mind 
I think that um, I would like to put forward an amendment, and apologies for not having this earlier, um, that the condition 2.1.2 is amended um, for a requirement for the CCTV footage of the service departments to be monitored from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. Monday to Friday and from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. on weekends and public holidays by the manager slash staff of the service department sister hotel Attica Hotel and for it to be available for immediate review 24-7. If I can get a second. Seconded, Councillor Murphy. Look, I think I've set my pace, so. Councillor Murphy. Oh, no, it makes sense, support. Any further comment, Through Councillor you, Harley? Um, I don't support the amendment. Um, what I see is a slow chipping away of all the issues that were raised when this came before Council and when we, when we looked at all of them. So we've seen a, a slow chipping away at a couple of um, items tonight. I don't think it's unreasonable. Um, this is what they committed to. Um, not that long ago, that's what this Council made our decisions about. And it's a bit, um, and I've used this terminology a little bit in the last few days, it's like a frog that gets just put in water and just keep getting boiled. It's just this slow chipping away and I don't think it's reasonable. I think they should have to be, if I've understood what's been written here. So we've got basically 9am to, it hasn't been written. 9am to 5pm, Monday to Friday. 9am to 5pm, so no... I'm oh, sorry, 9am to 9pm, 9 9 my yeah. apologies, and then 9am to 5pm, yeah. Saturday, Sundays and public yep. holidays. 7 to 9, yep. So oh, I'm not... I'm, I mean, maybe antisocial behaviour occurs during the business hours, but in my experience, antisocial behaviour um, occurs, tends to occur more likely at night, I'm happy to be corrected by the administration. I don't think it's reasonable. I think this is what the applicant committed to. Um, and I am not comfortable at all now saying you don't have to monitor this. Um, in the exact hours when antisocial behaviour is most likely to occur, I'd be interested to know from the director about the complaints that we have had and what the times um, have been um, reported as being the times when the antisocial behaviour has occurred. And I think that probably needs to be um, responded to through you, Chair, to the Director. Through you, Mayor Cole, um, the complaints we've received and the, the anecdotal feedback we've, uh, we've had from residents does tend to suggest that most of the antisocial behaviour does occur at night time. Yeah, so I guess in asking, um, in having this amendment before us, what we're saying is the Antisocial behaviour primarily occurs from the reports at night. Anecdotally, we could probably say that that is when more antisocial behaviour occurs and is reported, and that's the exact time we're saying that that the CCTV cameras do not need to be monitored. The fact that it's available immediately does not in any way reassure me, and I don't believe will reassure residents in Harwood Place either. It essentially means that the reporting of the antisocial behaviour or the dealing with it will rely on complaints. Um, and yes, the CCTV will be able to be immediately reviewed on request, but that could be hours and hours and hours later. And that means the antisocial behaviour does not get dealt with at the time that it is viewed on the CCTV cameras, where it's occurring, obviously, in the common areas. I accept um, antisocial behaviour also occurs on the street um, and may obviously occur within the apartments. So I see this as a chipping away of very important conditions we put in place um, uh, for this building. Councillors, um, look, I will speak in favour of the amendment, and the reason I do that is because what is also conditioned here are um, regular patrols um, for a night on Saturday and uh, Friday and Saturday night. So that's actually having security guards who attend enter patrol the building. That is something new to this application. I think that having that presence at the site is very important. Um, particularly, I know that in this instance the applicant was seeking that there um, be less on a Friday and Saturday night, but what is recommended to us by administration is that there are four security patrols entering the building on Friday and Saturday nights and that there is one security patrol on Sunday through to Thursday nights. So I think that um, to me the CCTV monitoring 
monitoring is something that I think is, is difficult to, to enforce given that the staff are not at Attica and they're not, not having that 24-hour reception presence there. And I see that in place of that, that this um, nightly patrols of up to f of four on a Friday and Saturday night is a very tangible and practical um, and um, good solution and something that I think is better than CCTV monitoring because you have a presence at site. So I will support the amendment. Are there any further comments on the amendment? I'll put it. All those in favour of the amendment? All those against? I declare it carried with Councillor Fatakis and Councillor Harley voting against. We're back to the substantive. Any further comments or amendments that wish to come forward? Councillor Gondoshevsky. I have a question in relation to the current operation of the facility. Um, the current approval is for a three-night minimum stay. Um, is the Acting Director of Development Services aware of what the current minimum night stay um, is being um, uh, enforced at, at the site? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, given the, the matter is subject to an appeal of the SAT, the State Administrative Tribunal uh, Administration haven't been actively policing the requirement. Director, are we aware of what the advertised minimum night stay is? Through you, Mayor Cole, no. So I am aware that on the website currently the minimum night stay as advertised to my understanding is um, two nights um, and there's also um, a, um, a, some, an ability for the people to choose um, to pay for parking um, at $25 a day. Um, so I think look, the things that we have heard um, today and in previous correspondence with residents of Harwood Place is that um, they are very keen to see the conditions of approval um, be applied, the existing approval be applied. Um, I think that we've seen um, through this process, we've seen an absolute tightening up of the um, management plan and the response to complaints that I um, am appreciative of. Um, however, we still are um, seeing issues um, raised with us by residents about the amenity impact of the operation of the facility in this very narrow um, and um, sort of close, um, close knit and um, and and uh, tight street. Um, so I think that um, it is really important that we actually give the. Um, existing conditions of approval in relation to the minimum night stay um, time to um, actually be enforced with this new um, uh, recognising that we sh with the tightening up around the management plan and response we also should see some improvement um, in, um, in the way that it complaints are managed. So um, I was the seconder to Councillor Murphy's amendment to go to two night minimum stay but I think that um, uh, Councillor Harley has uh, swayed me in relation to um, actually putting forward an amendment to a um, minimum of three nights for all guests of the service departments. Seconded Councillor Harley. Um, I think that this is something that um, you know, we need to see if the management of the facility as set out in the um, uh, management plan, that's the, um, the recording of complaints and um, uh, is able to minimise the impact of this facility on the residents. Um, I, um, and so I think that um, we actually need to see if it, um, as the approval, as was in place, um, is currently in place in relation to minimum might stay, is able to... Um, uh, impact on um, um, both antisocial behaviour but also around change over times. You know, reducing changeover is likely on a narrow street to um, potentially um, improve amenity for residents as well. So um, I think we need to see if this um, really look at the preventative elements associated with this um, by increasing the minimum night stay to three nights or not increasing it but in line with the current approval. Councillor Harley. It's so 
articulately said by Councillor Kondrzewski. I have nothing else to add. Councillors, we're debating an amendment to increase the minimum night stay to three nights. The substantive is currently two nights. Are there any further comments in relation to this amendment? Councillor Murphy. Just make a comment. I wonder, uh, I do support three nights stay, but I wonder if we uh, could potentially, I don't know what the procedural motion of this is, but uh, the other amendment is put up uh, that we have on the orange here, maybe we could take part of this where it, the stay involves a Friday night, Saturday night or a Sunday night before a public holiday, um, just because we are obviously trying to prevent 24-hour um, parties on weekends, <clears throat> which is the problem. So uh, I was thinking maybe in the uh, good-natured compromise, <laughs> maybe the... Uh, um, Councillor like Murphy, you can't amend an amendment, so we just, okay. your comments are we'd welcome, re, but we you would need to amendment. put forward okay. a, a, an amendment following the consideration of this amendment, but you're, sure. you're, you're more than welcome to comment. No, that's fine. Councillors, any further comments in relation to a three-night minimum stay? Um, look, I just wanted to, before voting, state that uh, my... Um, my consideration was about having a minimum night stay. Um, I think that when you're moving amendments, you need to support an amendment because you don't know what's going to come next. So sometimes you support a lesser than you might um, require because you don't know what's coming next. In relation to this particular application, um, I do think that the residents have, have expressed an expectation that we maintain the conditions. Um, in terms of how it's actually operating, I believe that it is operating under a two-night minimum stay, given that's what's been advertised. And I think that that, in concert with the um, increased security patrols, I think that's um, working better than it has been. And I think that the fact that we're now requiring those security patrols to be ongoing, whereas previously we talked about having an intensive period of um, increased security patrols and dropping back, I think that, for me, um, the fact that we have a two-night minimum stay with some intensive um, security patrols on a Friday and Saturday night. That that does satisfy me that this um, this is probably okay in terms of what's already proposed. But um, I do understand the sentiment, and I am sympathetic to it. So I'll put the amendment. Unless there are any further comments, all those in favour of the amendment, all those against, I declare it carried. Uh, all those, all those, you're against. Okay, can I have a show of hands? Those in favour of three night minimum, and those against. That's carried. Thank you. We're back to the substantive. Any further amendments that wish to come forward, or any further discussion on the substantive for those who haven't already put their deliberations forward? Madam Mayor, just a quick comment which just confirms my understanding. I know Councillor Harley asked the question, but just for clarity, my understanding, and I have substantiated it, um, the, owner, the ownership of the property hasn't changed in the time since it was built. Uh, the uh, application, the management plan, which referred to a three-night minimum originally was by a company known as Veranda Apartments, which was not uh, the owners. And my understanding is that uh, the owners, the current owners since took over and when it became Zappian Apartments that they actually took over the management of it uh, and the subject of the last two applications, even though the, applic the applicant themselves uh, was different, that the critical issue was always the minimum night stay. And so there is that difference between the management plan as was originally submitted and the proposed conditions. And I understood from the director that uh, it was an inherited uh, uh, commitment that was made and that wasn't uh, ever the intent of the current operators and I viewed just wanted to say publicly that I viewed the application and the uh, the requests on that basis. Thank you Councillor Toppelberg. Comments or amendments? Councillor Murphy. Sorry I will in the interest of uh, because we are in a SAT mediation <clears throat> I think we should make some sort of concession if possible. So I would like to amend <laughs> The accommodation duration is restricted to a minimum stay of three nights for all guests of the service departments where the stay involves a Friday night, Saturday night or a Sunday night before a public holiday. If I could get a seconder, I would like to put that up. Is there a seconder? There being no seconder, the That's amendment fine. falls. Um, I think there's actually been a misunderstanding. I didn't 
wish for this amendment to be put on the table. I actually had an amendment that was around car parking. I'm just wondering if it's possible to put that up onto the screen so that council members can see that amendment. I will read it out to you in the meantime. Um, the condition that I had requested to be placed on the table for consideration was that a new condition 2.1.5 be inserted as follows. 2.1.5, each service apartment shall be provided with the option of access to one dedicated and fee-free parking bay. If you wish. You wish to move it? I'm Is there a seconder to, to that amendment? Seconded, Councillor Harlot. Councillor Harley. I'm happy to waive my um, um, move the speaking rights if you wish to speak, me. Councillor Harlot. Okay. Um, the reason that I put this amendment forward is that I believe that when this um, development was originally approved as a multiple dwelling, um, there was a car parking requirement attached to that and that that was pretty much one bay per apartment. Um, my concern is that applying a cost to a uh, bay um, would uh, disincentivise residents from using, uh, sorry, visitors to the short-term accommodation to um, utilise that car bay and seek to park elsewhere. I do acknowledge that there are some pretty tight parking restrictions on Harwood Place, but I think that where we have situations where they are not adhered to or thwarted, it shouldn't really fall to the responsibility of rangers having to continuously attend when there are bays available within the serviced apartments. Um, this is to limit the free um, fee free parking bay to one per room uh, to one per apartment that is hired and um, it is up to the uh, particular person to accept that option if they don't accept it it can then go back into the general pool of parking and under this uh, recommend uh, under this amendment uh, if it were to be adopted it would mean that if people wanted to then have two car parking bays available then they would the um, applicant would be able to charge for the second car parking bay so I don't believe that in this street location given the um, limited and uh, parking that's under pressure that is uh, often residents only that it is um, reasonable to expect that car that people uh, staying in the apartments are made to pay for a single car bay and I believe that that parking requirement should support the occupancy of those units. Are there any further comments? Okay, I'll put the amendment. All those in favour? Declare it carried. We're back to the substantive. <coughs> Councillor Toppelberg, have you spoken to the substantive? I'm just asking a question, asking so a it's question? irrelevant. Yep. Go ahead. Just through you to the um, di director. Given the changes that have been made uh, to the proposal, am I correct that, I mean obviously there's, there's still a decision to be made on the substantive, but in terms of what was actually being contested at the SAT, uh, am I correct that we are returning to square one and that what, is, what this effectively amounts to a, whilst it's looking to approve, what's before it's potentially an approval, it is effectively a refusal of uh, the requests that were made via the SAT process and the reconsideration with the return to the three nights. Is that correct? Through you, Mayor Cole, yes. Uh, if Council was to adopt the substantive position, um, it would mean a number of the key items that uh, form part of the appeal were, would probably not be resolved to the applicant's satisfaction uh, and it would be open to the applicant to pursue this matter further through the SAT process. I'd like to respond to that question. I think it's a bit of give and take. There's been some give on the CCTV um, requirements. Oh, so I wasn't making comment on the, the surrounds of it, just whether yes. we, this effectively amounts to a refusal of the request by the applicant to remove the minimum night stay, which was the reason we went to SAT in the first place. Fair That's comment. All. So we're at the substantive. Are there any further comments in relation to this application? I'm going to put it. All those in favour? 
I declare it carried. Thank you. Okay, the next item that was raised um, by a member of the public gallery was item 13.1, approval to advertise draft strategic community plan 2018 to 2028. Can I please have a mover and seconder? Moved Councillor Murphy, seconded Councillor Gondoshevsky. Um, won't talk to it too much. You did a good job of it in your opening address. Um, I do want to acknowledge um, it was a massive team effort to put this together, amazing team effort. Um, big, uh, big ups to Len and uh, Mick Quirk and Ros Ellis in particular. Um, but uh, it was a whole of, uh, whole of city contribution to get this um, really wonderful um, piece of work as far as I'm concerned. Um, wonderful uh, vision statement. Really like the, um, the city's interpretation of the vision statement as well. Um, I think that uh, you know, it really brings in line uh, elements that are happening globally around what's happening with local governments. We're seeing... Um, 24-hour lifestyle committees being set up in New York and nightmares and, um, uh, you know, local governments um, supporting um, nighttime economies. I haven't heard that for a while. Nightmares. Nightmares. Um, you call it night, night lifestyle <laughs> mares. <laughs> um, uh, Green leafy suburbs, of course. Um, I think it's. Um, I think the the sentiment is to support the aspirations of dreams of the council as much as as a council as much as we can. Really comes through, um, and uh, yeah, congratulations everyone who made it happen. Thank you, Councillor Murphy. Councillor Gondoshevsky. Oh, look, I just wanted to say that. Um through this process, I think the city has put the community at the front and centre um, through Imagine Vincent, through the community engagement panel, but also through um, sort of undertaking a, a quality assurance process as we developed the document, continuously circling back to the words that the community um, spoke through the consultation um, and um, an ongoing engagement with the people that were part of that process. So this is the next step where we, um, we go out to the community through advertising and I'm confident um, and I'm looking forward to um, hearing their response in this document. Thank you, Councillor Gondoshevsky. Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you. Um, oh, I am denied about whether to mention it, but I will talk about Mr Myers' libris return to the gallery and uh, his, his comments. Uh, I disagree entirely. Uh, this is absolutely a plan. This is a high-level strategic plan which articulates the vision of the community and to stand in the gallery and say that you don't question the intent but you think that you could have got the results anyway or most of it would have been known anyway completely undermines the whole principle of consultation, the whole principle of the process and the whole principle of developing a community plan and I think that it misses the mark. Uh, thank you for the advice as well to have a look at Frio and Vic Park. We spread our wings further than that and looked globally. Uh, at best practice and looked at what people were doing all over the world. Um, I am... I'll try and find the right words to say it without saying something I shouldn't, but uh, I am insulted at the comments that came from the gallery. I think that it's um, just throwing mud for no reason. Uh, I think that what we have um, and uh, the words that are contained there will, uh, will frame uh, what happens within this community for the next 20 years. And I think there's a lot that we can be proud of and hang our hat on, and I think there's a lot that we can point to uh, that will absolutely be uh, taken down into specific plans that will, give, that will have more detail. Uh, but as a broad strategic plan, I think it uh, not only hits the mark, I think it's absolutely representative of a lengthy, yes, expensive, but a lengthy and uh, worthwhile process. And I think we should actually be feeling even more proud that the answers that we came up with were largely in line with what we would have thought in the first place because of the job that we're doing. Uh, and that's more a pat on the back than it is something to stand there and sling mud about. So, um, yeah, I'm uh, very pleased uh, that we've arrived where, where we're at and I look forward to seeing um, the comments that come back from the community. It's by no means uh, a final document. It's a living document that will evolve over time. Um, but in my understanding of what a strategic plan should look like uh, and feel like, it shouldn't be the excruciating... Uh, uh, little things. It should be high a high-level document that articulates a long-term vision, and this does exactly that. 
Touche, Councillor Toppelberg. Councillor Harley, do you wish to speak? Oh, sorry, I thought you were nodding that you wish to expect you're just enjoying the deliberations. <laughs> okay. Does anyone else wish to speak in relation to the strategic community plan? I did make some comments at the beginning of the meeting, so I won't go on, but I really hope that when we take this out to advertising that the words in this document really ring true and that when a community member who participated in this in this uh, Imagine Vincent process to come up with this document will feel that, that, that a piece of them is reflected back in this because I think that as Councillor Gondoshevsky said, even in terms of being true to the language that was used by community members, like we have tried to, to mess with the feedback as little as possible but to simply sort of bring it together and to frame it in a way that works as a cohesive, simply read, easily presentable um, strategic community plan. And those things are often, in policy writing and strategy writing, as we know, Councillor Gondoshevsky, the hardest things to achieve. So we did not wish to um, come out with reams and reams of paper, but we wanted something that really succinctly and, and um, clearly represented back to the community what they told us. And I do think that we... Um, that we will hopefully receive from our community a big tick of endorsement of what we have put together. Any further comments? Okay, I'll put it. All those in favour? I declare it carried unanimously. Thank you. I'll now go back to the beginning of the agenda and move sequentially through the items that have not already been debated or moved on block. So that brings us to item 9.3, 462 Beaufort Street, corner of Broome Street, Highgate, proposed amendment to condition of approval, signage and paid car park to shop. Can I have a mover and seconder for this item, please? Moved Councillor Hallett, seconded Councillor Loden. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I, I support the general um, gist of this um, admin re recommendation, but um, there are a couple of amendments, um, including one for myself. So. I'm happy to go straight to that if... Um... Um, which amendment do you wish to move, Councillor Hallett? Uh, on the green. Yes, I just want to... Dan was nodding. Um, Councillor Loden, are you nodding in agreement that you're prepared to go straight to the amendment? Which amendment, Councillor Hallett? On the green? That Thank green. you. Yep. yep, go ahead. Um, so this amendment is essentially just to replace the recommendation for oriental plane trees um, with an alternative native species as identified through the city's new tree selection tool, either ghost gums or yellow bloodwoods. Um, whilst there are already oriental plane trees in the Mount Lawley Town Centre and indeed probably hundreds across the city, my preference would be not, to not plant any more for a, a couple of reasons. Um, one's to maintain the unique biodiversity and aesthetic of a Western Australian precinct rather than replicating the many plane tree filled town centres that exist around the world. Um, and secondly, whilst it's less allergenic than a London plane tree, there is still evidence of its contribution to airborne allergens. Um, which affect me as well as a number of community members that we hear from from time to time. Um, the City of Perth and Melbourne, among other councils, are no longer planting new plane trees. They're also identified as being vulnerable to extreme heat, which is not so good for uh, the context of a changing climate. So um, my preference would be to have an Indigenous species. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hallett. Councillor Loden, do you wish to speak to the amendment? Councillors, any uh, comment? Councillor Gondoshevsky? I just have a question in relation to the location of the tree wells and, and um, the trees that are proposed to be removed and um, replaced. Um, this, and um, whether under our current built form policy those tree wells would be in existence should the site be developed from a car park? Um, given its location and proximity to a town centre. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, um, the proposed landscape plan shows the location of three trees towards the, uh, the corner of the site at the intersection of Broome and Beaufort Street. Uh, based on the built form policy, um, a future redevelopment of the site would potentially have a nil setback to both public streets and a 4.5 metre setback from the abutting residential property to the east. So um, effectively that would mean the location of those trees would 
potentially mean that they need to be removed as part of a redevelopment in future. Thank you. I'm, and I appreciate that this is probably not advice that can be provided on the hop, but um, of the tree species proposed, um, their potential for successful transplantation, should they be need to be moved if the site was developed? That's what you may call. I'm afraid I've not got that information at hand. Look, I'm supportive of the recommendation. I think that um, I'm familiar with this site and that the um, current trees that are planted there don't really provide a great deal of um, either visual amenity or I think really the likelihood of much shade in future. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, fine. Councillors? Um, look, I'm speaking in support of the amendment. I think that we now have a tree selection tool and we should be using it. So it's good to see it put to use and would like to see more of it. Any further comments? OK, I'll put the amendment. All those in favour? Declare it carried. We're back to the substantive. Councillor Lowden. Um, I'd like to move an amendment. Um, I'm disappointed it couldn't be on the dark green. Um, it's the, uh, the, I guess, mauve one, um, with the uh, exception that rather than it's, say, the provision of six shade trees, the provision of four shade trees. And I'll talk to if I can get a seconder. Sorry, I'm slightly confused. Are we talking about six shade trees or four shade trees? So um, the, uh, I'm currently there's three yes. required and I'm proposing we change it to four. Okay. And that it, those be specifically located in the eastern corner of the development. Okay, so in terms of the text on the purple, is there any amendment to that or is that as yes. written? Yes, so the, the, the amendment would be instead of it saying provision of six shade trees, say provision of four shade trees. Thank you for the clarification. Can I have a seconder for the amendment? Councillor Hallett. Uh, so we've got a, since this was originally approved, we've got a new built form policy that specifies in quite a bit of detail landscaping requirements. Um, open air car parks such as this are required with, to achieve an 80% canopy target and to plant one tree for every four car, par car parking spaces, which uh, as administration points out is um, 6.25 trees. Um, but the additional consideration in this is that this is a very high potential development location. Um, you're looking at six storeys, um, three storeys which are nil sat back on the primary and the secondary street. Um, so in recognition of that, I'm comfortable that we have a lower number of trees, but there's still clearly opportunity to increase the canopy in this development without that being removed in the future if those trees, are, if that, if the, an additional tree is appropriately located. The proposal is to put that additional tree in the eastern side of the development, which is on the, um, on the, I guess the rear setback area within the 4.5 metre setback that would be expected as a deemed to comply for this development. The reason for doing that now as well is that if this is eventually redeveloped, we're going to have potentially a six-storey development backing onto an, an R80 area where there are like, uh, where people are residing. If you do have a tree in there that is uh, somewhat more progressed in its growth and so forth, that will help to alleviate those impacts on those neighbours as well. Um, so I see this as an appropriate middle ground for not requiring the full amount of uh, trees that we would typically for this type of development, uh, but also do something to help transition for um, what will be there in the future. Thank you, Councillor Lowden. Councillor Hallett, do you wish to speak? Any councillors wish to speak to the amendment? I'll put it. All those in favour? I declare it carried. We're back to the substantive. <coughs> Councillor Gonshevsky. I have an amendment. Um, look, I think. The, my amendment is just that um, to um, essentially bring the development approval back in line with what would have been in place if the um, application had been put in at the time that the previous approval applied. I acknowledge that it would still be open at the end of this. Oh, hold on. I won't speak to it. I will see if I can get a seconder. Thank you, Councillor Gonczewski. Seconded, Councillor Jimmy Murphy. Thank you. Um, look, 
I, I acknowledge that it would be open to the landowner to lodge a subsequent application. I also note that the future intent for the site is probably not as a uh, paid car park. It's a corner site, visible location adjacent to a town centre, um, and so perhaps it would um, uh, facilitate a reconsideration of options um, at an earlier stage if the approval was as it would have been um, if we um, if it had been um, managed in a, 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 the transition had been managed um, uh, continuously um, yes that's all councillor Murphy yes support uh, the intent of the amendment and um, yeah happy to support no further comment councillors okay I'll put the amendment on the yellow all those in favor declare it carried unanimously Back to the substantive. Are there any further comments, Councillor Toppelberg? Uh, actually, no, I won't. Are you sure now? I'm going to put it. Further comments before I put the motion? Okay, I'm putting it. All those in favour? I declare it carried. Thank you. The next item is 9.4, number 47, Eugen Street, Mount Hawthorne, proposed five grouped dwellings. Can I have a mover and seconder for this item, please? Councillor Gondoszewski, seconded. Councillor Toppelberg. Um, I wanted to pull this out, um, but I uh, don't really feel that I can support it. Um, I think there's, it's adjacent to a site that's likely to be developed. It's a small street with a cul-de-sac. Um, and I think that I get um, somewhat frustrated where you have um, full development of sites, but um, you know uh, things like visitor bays are not able to be accommodated. Um, I also note the um, uh, issues in relation to the outdoor living areas and have concerns in relation to amenity for future residents. So that's me. Councillor Toppelberg. Yeah, I'll be more blunt. If you're going to build something that cookie cutter, make sure it complies because you're offering absolutely nothing to suggest that you should receive any concessions in return. Councillors, any further comments? <coughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to put it. All those in favour? All those against? I declare it lost. Um, so we have a recommendation for refusal. Um, can we please go to an alternate with grounds for refusal? Can I have a mover and seconder for um, a alternate motion? Moved Councillor Gondoszewski, seconded Councillor Toppelberg. Perhaps we could uh, workshop those reasons. Uh, I think obviously there's issues in relation to... <laughs> uh, well, in terms of parking and access, the um, uh, no visitor bay provided on site. Um, the failure to meet um, provide um, uh, an appropriate uh, design for the outdoor living areas and the um, issues in relation to um, the provision of stores, in, 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 inadequate provision of stores. Councillor Toppelberg, do you wish to add any further reasons for refusal? No, I'm comfortable with that. Um, I'm, I am Councillor Gondoszewski. We will need you to revisit the reasons for refusal so that they can be captured, if you wouldn't mind. Yes. Lack of provision of a visitors of a visitor bay. Uh, the amenity impact uh, of the reduced outdoor living areas. And insufficient uh, uh, provision of stores or inade inadequate provision of space for stores.
Councillor Harley, just to fill you in, we are dealing with item um, nine point. I've just scribbled over it. Nine point four, <laughs> um, and there has been a um, vote against the officer motion, and we are now putting together a recommendations for refusal as an alternate motion. Okay, we have the motion before us and we have had a mover and seconder. Councillor Gondoshevsky, do you wish to speak to it? No. Councillor Toppelberg? Oh, to be less harsh than I was in <laughs> earlier, just to say I, I do think that you know, the, the built form policy doesn't, isn't very prescriptive in terms of uh, design, but all of these things, whilst in isolation they may appear minor, they actually contribute to a overall a minor overdevelopment of the site which does have a negative impact on the amenity and clearly if you look at uh, this part of uh, this area which has been uh, earmarked for significant development so between the freeway and, uh, and Brady Street in that area the cumulative effect that we're seeing even now of the impact upon uh, car parking in that area uh, we hear about it every time we get a DA and if you look to Milton Street and others where we, we, it's a continual so it's not a uh, this isn't nitpicking uh, uh, based on, from my point of view, based on the views on the design, I think that overall uh, they are maximising the yield at the expense of the surrounding community. I think that needs to be addressed uh, before I'm prepared to put my hand up for it. So I will support the alternate. Councillors, um, I will speak against the alternate. I think that the reasons for me is I don't feel there's sufficient grounds um, for refusal on this particular, in this particular matter. Um, design aside, um, also because it is an R100 lot and in this location it is on that um, sort of quiet part of Eugen Street where it is going to be abutted by an R100 building and at the moment it's not, it's not um, on one of the um, more populated residential R60 streets um, so I don't see this as having a significant impact on streetscape and because of the higher zoning I think there would be um, harder to um, to fight this in a review situation so I'm, I'm not um, going to support the alternate motion but I do respect my colleagues in bringing it forward. Are there any further comments in relation to this? Okay, I'll put it. All those in favour of the alternate motion? All those against? I declare the alternate carried. Thank you, councillors. We're moving on now to item 9.6, which is 440 William Street, Perth, change of use from office to educational establishment. Can I have a mover and seconder, please? Moved, Councillor Loden. Seconded, Councillor Gondoshevsky. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, in uh, in interest of time, um, I, I'm, if, and if uh, Councillor Gondoshevsky is amenable, I'd like to move the amendment uh, on Councillor the Councillor Gondoshevsky, are you happy to move the uh, amendment? Second, rather? Yes. Yes. Are you reading it? Yes. Yes, that's fine. Go ahead. And just a quick question through to the Director. In terms of the commentary back, um, the last statement says, if such a condition is imposed, it is recommended that a maximum of two bicycle facilities racks be required which will accommodate four bicycles. Am I correct in interpreting that four additional Class 3 bicycle parking facilities would be achieved through the two bike racks? Is that correct? Through you, Mayor Cole, yes. The staff staff's advice through the briefing minutes, briefing notes, sorry, is that the, uh, the actual facilities refer to the number of bikes that can be stored. Thank you. Uh, so I guess the intent behind this is we are seeing a densification of the use of this site. We've got uh, four classrooms and potentially 100 students coming into those classrooms at these times. Um, there is limited parking in that area and the intent is very much to get them to access public transport, bikes and so forth. There is already provision of bike bike bays in this site, but um, I feel that we should be providing additional bays. The policy speaks to one bay per classroom, um, and so that's where the four uh, additional bicycle parking facilities came from. Thank you. Councillor Gondoshevsky. 
Councillor Toppelberg. Um, just a question through you to the director. I'm a bit perplexed about the, in terms of policy. So the requirement is effectively, so the requirement effectively is that we will, the applicant, that it'll be decided on a case by case basis. Is that correct? That that the city will determine on a case by case basis what would be appropriate. Through you, Mercole, yes, that's correct. Okay, and the policy that Councillor Loden is referring to in relation to the one bay, per, one bicycle bay per classroom, um, and, the, and there's nine bays being provided, is that correct? Through you, Mercole, yes, that's correct. Um, look, I, look I, I don't, it's not a big deal. I don't think that the, that the application is going to fall over on the back of it. But I just, for me, in principle, the, if, if we've determined that what's, well, if what's being provided on the site is more than double what we're actually asking for, if we believe that it's an appropriate use for the site and we believe there's a shortfall in public infrastructure to support it, I don't know that that necessarily uh, falls directly on the applicant to provide it. But I, um, I won't oppose the amendment. But I think that if we consider that there are inadequate bicycle facilities within William Street to support what are uh, reasonably expected or, or, or wanted uses within the area. It's not far from TAFE or otherwise. There's plenty of educational uses in the area. I think that that's something that probably is the city's responsibility rather than an applicant where they're providing more than double the number of requested bays. That being said, I, at a rough guess, I think we're talking about probably $300 worth of steel going into uh, to, be, to be placed in the, in, the, in the public area. I'm just not sure that the requirement to place that on the, this applicant and uh, this DA uh, is necessarily ringing true, but I, I won't oppose the amendment. Councillors? It is certainly a valid consideration. Um, can, so just to go back to that, they're compliant in terms of the provision of bicycle bays. Are we saying that because they're seeking discretion in other areas that we are requiring them to provide additional bike bays? Is that the argument? <laughs> yeah, I'll ask you the question. And so, did you consider yes. whether the city should provide this infrastructure instead of the applicant? So my understanding is the uh, provision of bike bays is for the entire development rather than this one specific uh, uh, development. And so there is multiple uh, tenants within that building and there is nine bike bays provided for the entirety of that development. We are removing an existing uh, tenant, I guess, from that building and replacing it with this one, which is more intensive use of that site. Uh, if the nine bays was adequate for the full site, then bringing in this tenant with a much larger footprint and a larger number of people needing to access the site, then it is appropriate to increase the specific obligation for that one because of the additional intensity that they're going to impose upon the whole development. Sounds reasonable. Um, any further comment? I'll put the amendment. All those in favour? I declare it carried. We're back to the substantive. Is there any further comment? Okay, I'll put it. All those in favour of the substantive, declare it carried. Thank you. <coughs> that brings us to item 9.11, late report submission on modernising WA's planning system, planning reform green paper. Mover. Councillor Loden, seconded. Councillor Gonshevsky. Mover was Councillor Toppelberg, seconder was Councillor Gonshevsky. I, I was explained as Loden. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> Apologies, it was That's your okay. convincing um, argument on the bike racks so that I was a bit distracted. Um, I will keep my comments brief. This is a part of a uh, broad process. Um, my limited exposure to the public sector, I understand what a green paper is. I uh, did appreciate the opportunity to um, meet together with uh, city's officers and the mayor um, uh, with the uh, author of the of the green paper and make some comments last week and I think that uh, I'm comfortable and confident that the intent at least from the consultant uh, is to have an open conversation uh, with government and with the sector about 
uh, fr from all aspects, and it's a, there's a, an element of, I suppose, give and take um, uh, from all. But uh, look at the, you know, I won't speak specifically to the uh, to the city's submission, other than to say that I, um, I think it's uh, it represents uh, what I understand to be the aspirations um, of the community, and also uh, expresses some of the frustrations that we as a an administration, a decision-making body, and also, if we look particularly at the larger-scale developments and the development assessment panels, um, it clearly articulates some of the, the shortcomings of that of that process. And uh, look forward to seeing the progress uh, as it moves through the, yeah, as, as the green paper evolves into what colour comes next? Is it white next? Yeah. It'll be white next. Thank you, Councillor Gonchewski. My glorious contribution may be limited to. Um, is there a typo? Yes, there is. And Thank you. Could um, we fix it? Please? I might just ask fixed? whether the mover and seconder would be prepared to accept this as an amendment that um, Clause 1 reads, endorses the submission included, so add a D, as attachment 2, as the City's response to the State Government's modernising Western Australia's planning, planning system green paper included as attachment Oh, um, full stop after green paper. Uh, are you happy to accept that as part of the substantive motion? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. Anyone else? Oh, I'm excited. <laughs> as you know, I've relished the opportunity to comment on the um, green paper because Somehow along the line of coming into local government, I've decided that I really like talking about planning. So it's been a really nice opportunity to, um, to talk about it, reflect upon it, look at what is proposed from the, review, um, from the reviewer's perspective and to sort of try to grapple with some of the issues and what that means for local government. And it was a pleasure to meet with Evan Jones um, last week and to put some of our questions and comments directly to him. And as Councillor Toppelberg has indicated, it does seem that he is very open to some um, you know, robust discussion and questioning and, and was quite accepting of some of the comments that we put forward. Nonetheless, it's important for us to respond to what is written in the green paper. And um, just in terms of the overall flavours, I think that as a local government who um, strives to, wo to work well with community in the space of local planning policy, of um, you know, trying to have a modern scheme for our times with delays that uh, were experienced that were outside of our control, that we do really passionately believe that um, local context and community aspirations is so critical to, to planning. Um, my concern is to not see the pendulum shift in the other direction and we have asked questions in our submission around whether we are looking at a more centralised planning system, whether we're happy to see further standardisation in the planning framework and just some commentary around whether we're moving towards more specialist-led decision-making away from community decision-making. So they were the sort of top themes that really emerged through going through this process. Um, some of it's not clear and I think that the reviewer is open to, to the questions and comments that have been put forward. But in terms of the pendulum, in terms of moving away from community-led planning um, to uh, specialist-led planning. We certainly don't want it to move towards specialist-led and we certainly have um, some discomfort in top-down um, decision-making. I don't agree that planning is a red tape reduction strategy. I believe that it's far more complex than that and that if you lose people um, in planning, then you lose planning um, to to poor design, to poor outcomes in local communities. So um, I guess this, this submission from the City of Vincent is really arguing strongly from the perspective of a local government who feels passionate about community-led planning, um, where we believe that our right to autonomy in local planning policy is paramount and where we would like to see that where you have well-performing local governments, that we're not brought down to the lowest common denominator in our sector, but that we are allowed to shine and that this accreditation system that's proposed as part of the Green Paper reforms could become a gateway 
for a council like Vincent, who's striving to work hard in planning and to deliver good outcomes and make good decisions, not only in statutory decision making, but in terms of infill locations, how we deal with density in our suburbs and how we um, basically plan for a, a, a future of Vincent, which really responds to our local communities' aspirations and wishes. So we're very much wanting to articulate that well-performing local governments should not be seen as the uh, sacrificial lambs in this process and that we would like a seat at the table to continue these discussions through to white paper. So this is, I guess, hopefully the start of that, of that process. Any further comments in relation to the green paper? Okay, I'll put it. All those in favour? Declare it carried. That concludes development services items for the evening. So we're now moving on to engineering and we have item 10.3, tender number 551 of 18, maintenance of bores, pumps and associated works. Mover, Councillor Lowden, seconded, Councillor Gonczewski. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, I really struggled with this uh, particular um, tender. Um, for the, the basic reason that we had two options on the table. One option was more expensive and better quality, and the other option was uh, less, less expensive and not as the same quality. Um, and I guess what I wanted to speak to, have my little say about, was um, the process we're using in informing our decision making here. To make this clearer for Council, when we're making these decisions, I think we really need to separate out the financial analysis of this from the quality aspect of it and then enable a discussion within the report of why we're recommending one or the other. In the other four tenders that we saw for tonight's meeting, the recommended tenderer was the cheapest one, but it was also the best quality one. So those decisions are easy, but whenever those points are coming up where we're making a qualitative assessment between money and quality, I think we need to make that a clearer and more transparent process for council when we're making those decisions so we know that we are choosing to spend more money on this tender for this specific outcome. Um, some of that information was provided in the confidential attachments but it was only through further discussion with administration um, that we got some additional information that made me comfortable with this decision but um, I think it would make up this process a lot simpler if we could separate those two out and then clearly articulate why those decisions are being made, that trade-off between those two things. It will also make it clearer for Council and the decision they make, they can actually look at that and decide if they agree that those additional benefits that we're getting from going one way or the other are achieved. That's my little rant. Thank you. Councillor Gondrzewski. Uh, this is something that I have heard Councillor Loden speak of quite a few times, really, over the, um, since October 2015. I know that there is um, some work in this space that is uh, close to fruition, um, but I think that um, I absolutely echo Councillor Loden's statements um, and I think that it will be much more uh, transparent and accountable to our community and make our decision making a lot clearer. So I look forward to, um, well, hopefully not hearing Councillor Loden have to talk about this in the future. Councillors, any further comments? Okay, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? I declare it carried. Um, we're now at item 10.5, which is uh, tender number 552 of 18, Traffic Management Services. Can I have a mover and seconder for this item? Move Councillor Gondoshevsky, seconded Councillor Loden. Um, Can I also just state that if there are concerns um, to be raised that uh, go to uh, issues of commerciality and confidence, and there is also the option that at any point during the debate we can have a procedural motion to defer that the item be dealt with later in the, in the evening and that we could move to go behind closed doors. Thank you, Mayor. Um, with that in mind, um, I would like to move a procedural motion that due to um, concerns around that um, a debate should um, contain issues of commercial and confidence and other issues, I would like to um, put it that we discuss this behind closed doors later in the evening. I'm just going to get um, Len to read out the relevant standing order. Sorry, CEO. Thank you. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole. That's quite right. I answer to both. Um, 
The, uh, the procedural motion that uh, Councillor Gondoshevsky has referred to, Council Members, is Clause 7.2 uh, of the Standing Orders, or sorry, of our Meeting Procedures Local Law, and that is that the motion be adjourned, which enables Council to adjourn discussion and debate on this particular issue to a later time of the same meeting or to a subsequent meeting of the Council. And uh, further to that, um, if the motion is adopted, then when Council gets to the point of considering that matter, I'd be happy to speak to um, what I believe are the um, provisions available under section 5.23 of the Local Government Act that enables Council to consider this issue behind closed doors. So that procedural motion has been moved by Councillor Gondoshevsky. Is there a seconder for the procedural motion? Councillor Toppelberg, there being no debate on a procedural motion, I'll put it. All those in favour? I declare it carried. Thank you, Councillor Gondoshevsky. All items from Corporate Services moved on block this evening, Director of Corporate Services. <laughs> Um, we're over to community engagement where we have report um, item 12.1. Um, notice of motion, Councillor Susan Gontoshevsky, strategies to improve participation and accessibility by women and girls at the City of Vincent Sports Ground and associated facilities. I'll just point out that there is a revised um, report on the table, um, item 12.1, just in case you haven't spotted that. Um, with a quite a different um, recommendation before you than what came to the briefing. So can I please have a mover for this item? Move Councillor Gondoshevsky, seconded Councillor Castle. Thank you, Mayor Cole. I won't speak for too long on this one. Um, I'm very pleased to see this report come back to Council and um, looking at the revised recommendation that has um, perhaps cons uh, both ex expanded on um, and provided some more detail about what is proposed. Um, I just want to make some clarification or, or, you know, just a few statements around the intent of the notice of motion. I mean, this was not necessarily about looking at um, women and girls' participation in sport um, and physical activity at a broader level, um, though I certainly acknowledge this as an important goal. Um, the intent of this notice of motion was about looking at the clubs and organisations that make use of the city's sports grounds and facilities with a view to increasing access uh, to these sports grounds and facilities and the sports that are played within and upon them uh, for women and girls. Um, I'm talking about tennis, hockey, cricket, soccer, footy. I don't necessarily consider any of these to be uh, male sports. I don't consider sports to be male or female. Um, I but, you know, if we look at the membership data um, for women and girls, it's, I mean, I'll be honest, it's terribly disappointing. Um, it's clear that a number of clubs have a long way to go um, in making space for women and girls amongst their ranks. Um, uh, there are a few shining lights amongst them. Um, and um, I think that the city can support this change. I'm supportive of the officer recommendation, although I, I was considering um, putting forward an amendment in relation to a further report back to Council just to make sure that we keep this one front and centre. Um, and just a question to the Director of um, Community Engagement in relation to the amendment um, as to what an appropriate time frame for a further report would be. Um, through you, Mayor Cole, the majority of the <coughs> recommendations um, under both points two and three um, will be complete or substantially progressed this financial year. So um, I would be more than comfortable with, a, with an update either early in the new calendar year or certainly um, no later than um, June next year. Perhaps if I could put forward an amendment for an update in February 2019. Um, can I just go to Councillor Castle first to see whether she's happy to um, support that as the seconder? Thank you. Yeah, so that would just be a new recommendation number four that, that Council receives an update on the above, uh, on two and three by February 2019. Do you wish to wait for the wording to appear on the screen? Okay. Um, Councillor Castle, you've seconded that amendment. Do you wish to speak to it? No, I'll reserve my right to speak to the substantive. You can speak to both, but you don't wish to. Thank you. All right, any further comment on the addition of a time frame to report back to Council? 
Okay, I'll put it all those in favour. Declare it carried. We're back to the substantive. Do you have any further comments, Councillor Konchevsky? No, I'm fine, thank you. Okay, I'll go to the seconder. Thank you. Through you, Mayor Cole, I'm uh, fully supportive of this um, this report, this uh, recommendation as amended, um, and echo Councillor Kontrashevsky's comments about this being an important piece of work. Um, I'm really pleased to see the expanded um, implementation initiatives that have been included and look forward to seeing that um, a broader collection of data um, to capture some of those um, sports that are female dominated but perhaps not um, not practiced in the city of Vincent uh, and I realize that's beyond the scope of the original notice of motion but I think that's an important part of the puzzle and I think it uh, it also opens that conversation for us to have uh, both internally and with other local governments about uh, providing facilities for some more of these sports to happen within our um, within our area or in close proximity to provide more um, opportunities for females to participate in the sports that they uh, traditionally do. Um, I'm also pleased or hopeful that this will include um, some of the activities being taken on uh, by our lessee, lessees, uh, such as gymnastics in Loftus Centre, um, uh, because I think that's also an important part of the, the picture. Uh, I also wanted to raise uh, an issue that was um, that I raised last week in the uh, briefing forum and that uh, was addressed in the briefing notes but perhaps was a little bit misunderstood. I raised a question about um, perhaps some initiatives that target high performance versus social participation um, and what I maybe didn't make clear was that my intent was to question whether there were some initiatives that would specifically target social participation because I think high, partic high performance participation is quite well catered for in a lot of sports um, but often where we see a lot of the drop off in participation from females is in those who are not at those high levels but perhaps just want to continue playing for, for recreation, for fitness purposes or just for the team environment that they get from playing a, a team sport so it would be great if um, that could be considered in future, whether in this particular initiatives or in um, future revisions of that. Um, but otherwise, I'm very happy to see uh, progress in this regard. Thank you, Councillor Castle. Councillors, any further comments? Um, look, I'll just briefly comment that I think that as um, Councillor Gondoshevsky and I tried to both kick and field soccer balls today at Perth Soccer Club on the beautiful new FIFA grade AstroTurf and I think I, my best catch was with my face. Um, we reflected on the fact that perhaps if we had had more opportunities as girls growing up to participate in soccer, uh, football, we might have had a better go at it. So, <laughs> so that was a bit of a case in point that we had a bit of a laugh about today. But I, I also would just like to say that I'm very supportive of this much more comprehensive response to the motion that's um, come forward from the Director of uh, Community Services, uh, sorry, Community Engagement. And um, I think that this is a much more um, well-rounded response response to uh, Councillor Gondoshevsky's um, original notice of motion and really delves into the issue deeply and looks at a number of ways in which we can strengthen girls and women's particip participation across all sports. So thank you for that. Any further comments? OK, I'll put it. All those in favour? I declare it carried. Thank you. So that brings us to item 14.1, Notice of Motion, Mayor Emma Cole requests to investigate options to reinstate the requirement to obtain development approval for demolition. If you could just bear with me for a moment, I'd just like to ask the CEO a question. I'm very excited to be able to move this notice of motion and that is uh, 
I move the motion. This is something that we recently changed in our meeting um, order meeting procedures to allow for the presiding member to move notices of motion. So I will move my own motion. Can I have a second to please? Seconded Councillor Toppleberg. Thank you. Um, do I wish to speak to it? Yes. Look, I just wish to speak to this. did attract a bit of media attention today. Um, and I just wanted to clarify that the reason I put up this motion was not simply about trying to address heritage in the City of Vincent, because we do have mechanisms in place to deal with heritage. We've got the ability for state heritage listing. We have our municipal heritage inventory within the City of Vincent, which is something where you can either voluntarily um, subscribe to or have your home put on there because it's so fa fantastic that the city makes that decision on your behalf. Um, and we also have um, a bespoke program where we are working with residents to deliver heritage areas and character retention areas. So um, this is just one part of the puzzle in terms of the City of Vincent being able to uh, speak with applicants about what options are available to them before they make the decision to raise their um, home, trees, everything to the ground and we have a lot that is simply uh, dirt, um, whereas before this, rec this uh, regulation was changed by the previous state government, we had the ability to actually have a development application process which involved the City of Vincent being able to have a dialogue with the applicant for that application to be advertised to the, to the neighbours or the local community for the city to be able to seek advice for the applicant from our design review panel and for us to have conversations with applicants about what sort of incentives there are in terms of retaining mature trees and also in terms of grants and things that are available if there is um, the option of retaining a character home. So I think that in the City of Vincent it's very, it's very important to differentiate between heritage and character because we've got both. And we have situations where it's not appropriate to put heritage um, restrictions in place because there is a high level of responsibility for the owner and there are some pretty strict grounds around what it is to be a heritage listed property. So in terms of um, trying to address what was taken away in 2015, we have a situation where um, unless your home is heritage listed or you're in a heritage area, effectively you can demolish your home by simply applying to the City of Vincent for a permit, which is really a tick box application to ensure that rats won't uh, run out of your demolition to the neighbourhood, that you have disconnected your services, that you've dealt with asbestos. So very perfunctory um, things that are dealt with through that process. And in terms of trying to look at whether, if it's not the state government reintroducing this um, this uh, regulation, which we will seek to continue to advocate for, is there anything that the City of Vincent can do within our scheme or within any other mechanism to require um, applications for um, demolition of single homes to come back through that development application process. So um, I have had quite a bit of feedback today about whether I'm trying to use this as a crude heritage instrument and that is absolutely not the case. It's about strengthening our character retention area policy because currently even where we do go through that work with streets and residents to have a character area, um, the, this, this lack of this um, uh, regulation means that you're still able to com demolish a home on a character retention area street without seeking development approval. So I do see this as a significant piece of the puzzle. Um, it was also important from the perspective of not having vacant lots just sitting in our neighbourhoods where a house can be demolished and sit there without development approval. Um, that is also an issue that this is seeking to address. And the argument that the, redu the removal of the regulation was a red tape reduction strategy, I just don't really, I don't really get that because I think that if you demolish a property, you are going to have to seek a development approval to build on that lot. So I don't really see how this shortcuts or provides some kind of red tape reduction initiative. I just don't buy that argument. So it's really about City of Vincent being really thorough in our um, investigation of this issue to, to rule out whether we you know, if we can't do anything about it, we need to rule it out completely so that when we go to the state government to have this conversation, we're very clear that it's outside our powers because it, it, I mean, I'm not being naive here to override a state government regulation. I just, you know, when you look at it on face value, it seems impossible. But we need to know clearly where we stand, what options are available to us, and if there are none, what options there might be available to the state government so that when we advocate for this, we're very clear about where we stand. 
That was it. <laughs> Four minutes, 59 seconds. Well, Thank you. Oh, that's my first moving of emotion. I'm going to enjoy it, right? Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you. Um, firstly, I, I, I just want to say that I'm very pleased that you brought, have brought this up. Um, I do note that the two previous occupants of your chair fought vehemently in this chamber for protection of that right. Uh, and uh, I've heard from both of them anecdotally, but one straight up, that, uh, and it was quoted in the, as a mysterious government spokesperson today as well, uh, said that it was about red tape reduction. That is just absolute rubbish. It has nothing to do with it. If somebody has a DA approval and comes with a plan for demolition, they can have just, it can happen just as quickly. It has, one has nothing to do with the other. So I think that the, uh, the, if the state is hanging their hat on it being about red tape reduction, it's a, uh, that's a winnable argument. This is, for me, it's just quite a simple principle and it's actually got to do with uh, sense of place, it's got to do with the value of built form in an area and it's just even common courtesy where it says to somebody, if you plan to demolish an existing structure, that the community around you has a right to know what's going to be there before it disappears. Uh, there are issues in terms of maintenance of, of vacant lots, there are also issues in terms of maintaining uh, vacant properties as well and I understand that and that, you know, that there are uh, circumstances where sometimes uh, uh, demolition might be preferable to, uh, to the existence of a, uh, of a lot, but that's something that can be worked through a council process. But to me, it's a fundamental principle of having a system that actually adjudicates over what can and cannot be built, that if someone is going to remove an existing structure, you have a right to know and they have an obligation to explain what should go there in its place. Um, the, there's uh, on that site that uh, was the subject of the photographs uh, in the west today, which is on Vincent Street, uh, there are... There's, um, there's foundations being poured, there's building activity on site. I haven't, I'm probably scared to see the result, but haven't asked uh, what's actually been approved uh, on the site, but largely uh, the community, and certainly under the current regulations, uh, if, it, if, uh, if the properties have been subdivided and they're single dwellings and are compliant, you actually don't even have a right to know. They just get built. Um, there, there are circumstances uh, in the immediate surrounding area um, where that has happened recently as well, and I think that you know, this is... What we're doing looking internally is one thing, but I think that we have a right to demand that Vincent be recognised for the fact that it is unique. We have unique lot sizes. We are a unique part of Perth's, uh, Perth's architectural history in the sense that uh, we have a lot of homes that were, or a lot of properties that were developed in the late 19th century, early 20th century, and a lot of the outer suburbs don't have those homes. I have no, in, uh, no issue with the principle of allowing a quick path to demolition, but I do think that that basic principle of knowing what's coming b uh, before it goes is something that we can and should fight for. Um, and whilst, you know, whilst we are looking at, as the Mayor has said, to be, to be looking for what we can do internally, uh, I absolutely think we should take, that, take the debate straight back to, uh, to the existing government, who when the previous uh, government changed the regulations, as I say, to an existing uh, uh, MLC who's a, a minister and uh, the Parliamentary Secretary to the Premier, who both sat in that chair, thought it was ridiculous at that point. So uh, I would imagine that that view hasn't changed and we should be uh, working with them to try and uh, ensure that that view is shared broadly across the state, but at worst applied at least in our little fiefdom here. Thank you, Councillor Toppelberg. Councillor Harley? Um, Chair, I'm just wanting to find out in terms of um, a developer what are the exact steps that they need to take at the moment under this current regime to demolish a property? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, assuming the question relates to a property that doesn't have any heritage status, uh, the landowner would simply need to lodge a demolition permit with the city's building service. OK, so one of the... Um, for um, all the reasons that have already been um, outlined, and um, I, I don't accept the red tape reduction. In fact, I'd like to see more red tape around um, demolitions, and I say that as a property owner who um, um, had to experience a demolition occur, um, <clears throat> and that was under the old regime where we did get notice, so we had at least some opportunity to get dilapidation reports, etc. A number of, um, over the years that I've been on council, a number of um, people have spoken with me about the level of damage that can be caused by um, a demolition. So I guess my concern about this new regime, um, accepting all the things that have been said about um, people having a right to know for a whole range of reasons, I do think this needs to be seen from 
the consume the um, the um, residents' perspective in the surrounding area as well, because it, uh, significant damage can be done via that demolition. Um, and I speak again from personal experience of having a building that has been damaged, but having spoken to a number of people who've had their buildings damaged through demolition and who were unaware um, in some cases um, because they're strata complexes, et cetera, that a demolition was even taking place. So I think there's a broader discussion here um, about, um, yes, sense of place um, and about um, um, people <clears throat> having a right to know what's going to be built and having some say I mean, what happens and also for us to be able to um, ensure that streetscapes are maintained, that we can have a discussion with owners about um, what other options they have but also for surrounding neighbours about having some protections in place and this is something I have spoken with a local member about and said that I do not believe residents are properly protected in the event of a demolition occurring and they are powerless once that damage has occurred. Um, again, you can fight for years uh, um, with lawyers and Supreme Court writs, with insurers, you name it, and I'm living through that at the moment again, and you end up with zero unless you have documented every step of the demolition process um, and every, every um, nook and cranny in your house about what it looked like before the demolition rolled in and what it looked like after. And that, for me, is of a significant um, concern. Um, one of my motivations for even running for council was the experiences I had um, 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 at the hands of um, you know developer and seeing what happened to some of my neighbours in um, in building circumstances. So that is part of the discussion I'd like to see um, pursued, and I'm happy to also pursue that m um, myself as a constituent. Councillors, any further comments on the notice of motion? Okay, I'll put it. All those in favour? I declare it carried. Thank you. Uh, that only leaves item 10.5 for us to deal with, but it is a matter that we do need to deal with behind closed doors. So um, we will say farewell to those who have joined the live stream this evening.